spending four weeks talking about a greater than or less than equation. And here's the premise for these four weeks. Grace is greater than whatever. Grace is just greater than. That's what Paul says in Romans 5, a couple different places, that the glorious grace of God is greater. It's just greater. And so I don't know what you would put in this blank. Last week we talked about how grace is greater than our sins and our failures, and I don't know what those are for you, but I want you to just to take a moment to fill in this blank in your own head. You know, I, I don't know what you would write. I, I don't know the sins you've committed or the mistakes you've made. I don't know the failures that you carry. I don't know the regrets that keep you awake at night. I, I don't know the secrets that you keep, but what I know, what I know is this equation. The grace is greater than anything you might write in that blank. And we just talked about it last week, this beautiful truth that God's grace is greater than all that stuff. And it's greater than our secrets. So we don't have to keep them in the dark. And when we finally pull our secrets out of the dark into the light, God's grace meets us there. And it is so beautiful. And God's grace is greater than our shame. He doesn't just forgive our sins. He forgives the shame. He forgives the guilt of our sin. He takes that away. It's greater than our shame. God's grace is greater than all of that. Now, I, I love talking about this on one hand. On the other hand, it's really frustrating to try to explain something that can't be explained, right? Like, if you're teaching about a subject, it's really helpful if it's possible to teach about it. And with grace... I can explain it, you can read about it, you can hear about it, until you experience it, you don't get it. Until you experience it, you really won't know what I'm talking about, and so you'll see this, the way people worship, you'll see the difference grace makes. And you might think, what, what is the deal with that person? Well, that's grace, it's grace. You see that in Luke 7, where this woman who's forgiven much, loves much, changes the way she worships. It just impacts us at the core of who we are. If you're a Christian, grace makes all the difference. And so we, we celebrate it as a church. We wanna do that as a community on a really regular basis because if you've experienced God's grace, I mean, if you're part of that community, then it's like, you know, it's like we've all been sentenced to life in prison and then we find out we've been set free. It's like we've all been diagnosed with this terminal illness and then we find out there's a cure. It's like we've all racked up this huge debt and there's no way we could pay it and then we find out the debt is forgiven. Well, of course we're gonna celebrate that. Of course we're gonna be joyful. And so we celebrate God's grace in our life, but here's what we're gonna do today is we're gonna flip the grace coin over and we're gonna talk about um, messy grace. Because when you're on the receiving end of grace, it's all good, right? I mean, we like that. We love to talk about that. But when you're talking about giving grace, gets a little bit messy, gets a little bit hard. Like grace is a lovely concept. As long as we're not talking about the father who berated you or the spouse who cheated on you, as long as we're not talking about the boss who fired you, the coworker who stabbed you in the back, the relative who abused you. I mean, it's, it's a fine idea as long as you're on the receiving end but it's a lot messier when we are called to give it. The Bible says in Proverbs uh, 14, verse 10, that every heart knows its own bitterness, meaning that all of us have been hurt. We all carry around some of those things with us, and maybe it was from years ago, maybe it was from when you were a child, but we've got these sins that have been committed against us, and maybe you were betrayed, or you were abandoned, or you were abused, or you were victimized, or you were ignored, or you were rejected, or you were embarrassed, or you were bullied, and grace suddenly gets a little bit more messy. So here's what we're gonna do. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 18. Matthew 18, and we're gonna study together a parable called the unmerciful servant. And here's what we're gonna learn is that grace is only grace if it goes both ways, right? Like biblical grace, grace that comes from God, the only way that's grace from God is if it goes both ways. If all you do is receive it, but you don't give it, then you've stopped short of what grace really is. And so I just kinda wanna say from the beginning of this message what... I want to make clear, and that is the extent to which we are willing to give grace reveals the extent to which we have received grace. It reveals how 
how much we really have received from God and how much we're just kind of faking it. It all becomes real when we're called to give it. Let me kind of put it to you this way, and this will make some people uncomfortable. That's okay. The litmus test for the reality of the gospel in your life is the extent to which you give grace and forgiveness to the person who's hurt you the most. The litmus test for the reality of the gospel in your life is the extent to which you give grace and forgiveness to the person who has hurt you the most and deserves it the least. That's when you know that all of this is real. It's when you know it's real. Is when you're called to give grace to someone who doesn't deserve it and who's really hurt you. In that moment, you find out that God's grace in your life is real. So here's how this passage starts off. Uh, Peter comes to Jesus with a question. Like a lot of Peter's questions, this one was loaded, right? Like he, he has an agenda behind this question. It's a general question, but I feel certain there's a specific story that motivates it. So, so here's the question that Peter asks Jesus in verse 21. Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times? So here's what he's going to do. He's going to set up a math problem. He's gonna give us an equation. How many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? So he kind of throws the number out there. Is seven times greater than grace? Now, if you know Peter, then you know Peter probably thinks he's being pretty gracious here. In fact, Jewish rabbis taught that you would forgive someone three times, but on the fourth time, you didn't have to forgive him. So when Peter throws out the number seven, he's like, would you say seven times, Jesus? Or is that just what I would say? You know, he, he's feeling very sure that you know, he's gonna get a compliment, that Jesus is gonna be like, Peter, seven times? Why can't all the disciples be like you? You know, I, I, he thinks that's what's gonna happen. He's throwing out this number that seems really gracious. But don't you think that Peter had someone in mind when he asks this question? I just feel sure that there is a face and there's a story that there's a, that's attached to this question. There's someone in life who hurt him, not once, not twice, but my guess is exactly seven times. And he's ready to be done. And maybe for you, it's not a certain amount, but it is the degree of offense. Like it's not seven times, it's just one time, but it's times seven, right? Because that's how significantly you've been hurt and you've been wounded. And so I think Peter's talking about someone specific, so who was he talking about? Well, I think it's safe to assume that it's probably someone he knew quite well. Um, There's exceptions to this. I mean, there are some of you who had someone come into your life just kind of long enough to bring about some destruction and devastation, and then they were gone. But for most of us, the people who hurt us the most are the people that we love, right? Because we give those people our hearts, and when we give them our hearts, we also give them power over us. And that power uh, can cause a lot of damage. Now there's, there's some of you who, who learned early on, you don't do that. That your heart isn't safe if it goes to someone else. And so you've worked really hard most of your life making sure that nobody, no one has that kind of power over you. And so you don't give your heart to anybody. You've carefully built up walls around your heart and no one gets through that. Because you've been hurt and you're not gonna be hurt again because someone you loved and someone you trusted, they let you down, they hurt you, they betrayed you. And so you, you don't give anyone that power because you give your heart away and, and it's only a matter of time. I don't know who it was for Peter, I, I don't know what name would come to your mind, but I know that behind this question for all of us is probably a name and probably a story. And, you know, I think Peter's question seems good. I think it's probably one of those we'd like to ask Jesus. Yeah, yeah, okay. I mean, as long as Peter's asking, I'd like to know. How far is too far? How much is too much? When does grace run out? And so he sets Jesus up with this equation. Here's what Peter wants to know. Okay, Jesus, when is this greater than grace? When does the hurt in my life, when does the pain that's been caused me, when does that flip the symbol? When does hurt become greater than grace? And, um, and Jesus answers, verse 22, he said, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Maybe your version says 70 times seven. What's Jesus saying here? He's saying, mm, grace is never less than. Grace is always greater than. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But let me tell you about my story, right? Right? 
I mean, let me tell you the story of my broken heart. Let me tell you the story of my betrayal. Let me tell you the story of my pain, of the injustice I've experienced. No, Jesus says grace is greater than. Now, when we hear that, we might accept that as truth if you're a Christian because Jesus said it. You're like, okay, well, if Jesus said grace is greater than, if he said 70 times seven, if, I mean, if that's what he says, but emotionally, it's hard to get our arms around. <laughs> like, we might acknowledge it's true. It doesn't feel true. I mean, if you're the one who's been hurt, if you're the one who's been left, if you're the one who's been abandoned and abused, if that's you, then, then you might say that's true. It just doesn't feel true. Because it feels like grace runs out. And so Jesus gives us a parable to help us emotionally get our arms around this truth that grace is greater than. And so verse 20, um, 23, here's where it begins. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. So <clears throat> there's this high-powered, kind of wealthy CEO type who looks at the, the books, looks at the accounting books, and he wants to collect. He decides it's time to collect. And so, verse 24 says, he began the settlement, and a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. That's a lot of money, 10,000 bags of gold. It's just the equivalent, uh, roughly, to about $150 million for us, or maybe puts it in a little better perspective, it's roughly 10 times the national budget for the people of that day. So it's an astronomical number. Sometimes people don't think Jesus used humor in his messages. He did, we just don't always get the joke, right? So if you were living then and Jesus would have said this amount of money, you would have chuckled a little bit because it's, it's hyperbole. Of course, of course a servant couldn't possibly owe the master that much money, but that's, that's the picture that Jesus paints for us. It's a debt that this man could never repay. Verse 25, since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. So in the ancient world, it was not unusual for there to be especially cruel treatment to someone who owed but wasn't paying. And so they would be sold into slave labor, their wife, children be sold into slave labor, everything they sold would, owned would be sold. And so that's what this guy says. He's like, look, you owe me $150 million. You're not gonna make a din in that. So I'm just gonna cut my losses, I'm gonna sell you and your family and everything that you own, and we'll, we'll close the books. So it's this huge debt. Now look, clearly, really early on here, in this parable, this is meant to reflect our standing with God. We talked about this last week. That all of us have sinned. And that sin has racked up a debt that we can never repay. Now we live in denial of it. We have all kinds of ways of trying to um, pretend like that debt isn't there. We compare ourselves to others. And, or, and then we finally maybe accept some of it and we try to work our way out of it. But then, look, it's too big. There's no amount of good deeds or benevol benevolent acts that are gonna balance the books. And so Matthew 18 just begins with this reminder we talked about last week that we all owe this huge debt. The Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says that if you're guilty of breaking one of the commandments, you're guilty of breaking all of them. Huge debt. And there's no sense in denying it, because he knows, he knows, kept track of it all. Um, over Halloween, my nine-year-old son, he takes trick-or-treating very seriously. Um, I mean, he's got it planned and mapped. He knows the route he's gonna take. For him, it's not a collection of candy, it is a competition to be won. And so he goes out, he, he literally chooses a costume for mobility. I mean, he wants to make sure he can get to where he's going quickly. And, uh, and so he goes out, he collects as much candy as possible, he comes back and he weighs it. That's kind of the goal. That's, that's, he, at the end, he takes the bag, he puts it on the scale, five and a half pounds. And he feels like it's been a good night. He's not thrilled with it, but he's okay with it. And so he's five and a half pounds of candy, and then it's time to organize. Right, and so he gets into this. He gets this from his mama. But he'll, you know, he takes all the chocolates and he freezes the chocolates. And he takes all the different kinds of candy and he, he even comes up with this log where he's keeping track. He just knows. He knows how many pieces he collected. It, he's, he's keeping track of, of, uh, his, of his candy. And, and I didn't know this year he had started actually keeping a log. Like, I didn't realize that. I knew he was, I knew he weighed it. And he kind of kept track in his mind, but I wasn't aware that it was on paper. And uh, so he went to bed, and he had left this all out, you know, organized. And I looked at this pile of Laffy Taffy. There's a lot of Laffy Taffy. I'm thinking, three pieces of Laffy Taffy. I mean, how much does that even weigh? Uh, it's five and a half pounds. It's, not, it's, it's negligible. It, it's not going to be a big deal. And so I, I take three pieces of Laffy Taffy. I stop there. I don't eat any more. And I um, think, you know, it's fine. I destroy the evidence. It's 
gone. And <laughs> the next day, the next day he, he, he says, Dad, we need to talk. And, uh, <laughs> and he's there to confront me. And so he sits me down and he explains to me that he knows that I've eaten three of his Laffy Taffies. And uh, he explains to me that he, he knows exactly how many he had when he went to bed and that there are three short of that now, and that I'm the most likely culprit, apparently. <laughs> um, and I'm in my mind thinking of how I'm going to justify this, you know, like I make your existence possible, stuff like that. <laughs> and before I really have a chance to kind of justify or make an excuse, he, he, he extends me some grace. He says, I, I don't really mind, it's fine, just next time I want you to tell me. Okay, okay, next time I'll tell you. That seems fair enough. Before I steal your hard-earned candy, I'll give you a heads up. So that, that's how that conversation went, where he kept track of it. I was found out. I thought I could get away from it. I couldn't get away from it. It's, just, it's right there. It's right there. He knew. And so the Bible kind of paints that picture that God, that God is keeping track of it, that there's this record of our wrongs. And so all these things we think we get away with that no one else knows about. Like, your teacher doesn't know about the paper you plagiarized in college, but God, God knows about that. And your husband may not know about the flirting at the gym, but God, God knows about that. And you may have deleted the history on your computer, but he has a history of the websites you've visited. And no one may know about your drinking problem, but he knows. And the windows on your house may be shut tightly so neighbors can't hear you yelling, but God can hear it from heaven. And the boss may not know about the embezzlement, but God knows about it. He knows about it all. He knows right now about the pride that some of you have because I didn't just give an example that applied to you. He knows about that. <laughs> like he keeps track of all of it. And the Bible, the Bible says nothing in all creation is hidden from his sight. And so he pulls up our account. Huge debt. Can't pay it. No way. Verse 26. At this, at this, the servant, when he finds out this huge debt that he owes, the servant fell on his knees before him. What else is he gonna do? And he says to his master, be patient with me and I will pay back everything. Well, no, he won't. I mean, it's ridiculous. There's no way for him to, to pay that back. There's no way for him to make this right. There's no way for him to balance the books. Jesus especially uses this astronomical number to make the point that repayment is not an option. He has no, no chance of it. Verse 27, it says though that the master took pity on him and here's what he did. He canceled the debt and he let him go. $150 million. And he just cancels the debt and he lets him go. It is this incredible act of grace. He doesn't extend the note. He doesn't lower the monthly payments. He cancels it. He cancels it, he erases it, and he lets them go. There's two verbs um, used here. One translated canceled the debt. The other one translated let him go. Both of these verbs could be translated and are translated in other places to forgive Okay, but it's used differently here, and we're, I want you to just pack that away because we're gonna talk about it in a, in a few moments, but, but first let me finish the story because it takes this disturbing twist. Um, verse 28, it says, when the servant, this guy who's been forgiven $150 million, when he went out, he found out that uh, one of his fellow servants owed him 100 silver coins, 20 bucks. Owed him 20 bucks. And he grabbed him, by the, uh, grabbed him and he began to choke him, and he said, pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And so this guy who's been forgiven $150 million refuses to give 20 bucks worth of forgiveness and he grabs him by the throat and demands to be paid back. Verse 29, his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. Exact, exact quote from what this guy had said to the master. So he's asking for the same grace that he had received except to a much lesser degree. Now if you've never heard this story before, what, what do you think is gonna happen? Of course, of course he's gonna forgive him. Of course. He was just forgiven $150 million. Of course he's gonna show mercy. He was just showing mercy. Of course he is. Verse 30, but he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay back the debt. Verse 31, real important verse. It's really easy to overlook in this story. Verse 31 says, when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged, and they went to their master and told him everything that had happened. So Jesus said, the fellow servants are the ones who reported him. The fellow servants saw how much grace had been extended and the fact that this guy refused to give it and they were outraged. Why? I mean, why were they so upset? It's because they all lived in community. 
They all lived in this community together where they have this master who does not treat them as servants but treats them as sons and daughters. Where they have this master who is over the top benevolent, generous, and gracious. They all live in this community. And when one of their own receives that kind of grace but then refuses to give it, it's a big problem. And they are outraged. Maybe your version says they were greatly distressed or also translated they were very sad. These are the appropriate responses. When we see someone in our community who has received grace but then refuses to demonstrate it, outrage. And so it seems off a bit that within a sermon on grace, there's also a call to outrage. But look, it's the only way that this little community here works. It's not gonna work if we just receive it but we refuse to give it. And so when we see brothers and sisters who have received God's grace act ungracious, big problem. Big problem. When we see someone who's received incredible grace start being judgmental to other people whose struggles are different than their own, very distressed. When we see legalism set in, we try to make ourselves feel better about ourselves by imposing rules that aren't even in the Bible, that's a problem. And so within this parable of grace, there's also a call for some righteous outrage that as a church, we're not gonna be okay with ungrace. It's not okay when one of our own is judgmental, condemning, gossiping about someone else who comes in and looks different or struggles with something different or is a mess. Because that's us. I mean, we're, that's us. And so you see, you see within this community this, this, this determination that they're gonna reflect the master's heart. And so the master finds out that this guy uh, who had received incredible grace was refusing to give it. Verse 32, it says, then the master called the servant in and he said, you wicked servant, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. You, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he, sh- until he should pay back all that he owed. Well, that's gonna take a long time. I mean, how long is it gonna take him in prison to earn $150 million? A long time, like forever. He's never gonna pay it back. He's gonna spend the rest of his existence in prison, living with this overwhelming guilt over what he did. You know what that's called? It's called hell. That's what happens here. And so oftentimes when Jesus tells a parable, the takeaway is a little bit vague, right? Like it's a little bit ambiguous, He sometimes leaves it for people to think through and to kind of go home with and, you know, marinate over, think about the meaning and the implications. Sometimes it's a little vague. It's not vague here. Here's how Jesus ends this parable. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Now, I know immediately some of you push back on that. Like, I mean, you you would say, what, what? You're telling me? That if I don't forgive the person who hurt me, who abused me, who betrayed me, who cheated me, who abandoned me, you're telling me if I don't forgive them, God won't forgive me? I'm not saying that. That's just what it says. I'm just reading it. Matthew 6, Jesus talks about some of these same things. And here's the clear lesson, right? That Jesus, the one who's getting ready to pay your bill, is gonna say, look, I'll pay it off. The debt is gone, But don't just receive grace from me, but you you need to extend it to others. It's not okay for you to come here week after week and celebrate God's grace that you've received and then you just hold on to a grudge or you hang on to the bitterness or you let resentment build or your hurt becomes hatred. I know it's not fair, I know that. Because those people owe you something, right? I mean, you've got it, it's right here, black and white. They owe you something and it's not right because they owe you at least an explanation. They owe you a childhood, for starters. They owe you a marriage. They owe you money. It's right here. I know. And that's called, it's called grace. You will never be asked to give more of it than you've already received is what we see here. So Jesus answers Peter's equation with an equation of his own. Here's the equation Jesus gives. Um, yeah, $150 million is greater than 20 bucks. In case you weren't sure, what you've been forgiven of is a lot greater than you'll ever have to forgive. And this is not to make light of what you will have to forgive. It's to say that the more you understand 
the holiness of God, the more you understand yourself, the more you realize how true this is. And, and if this equation doesn't make sense to you, then you don't really understand the gospel. And you don't really know yourself. I heard a, a quote um, the other day from Pastor uh, Jean Leroux, and here's the way he puts it. If the biggest sinner you know isn't you, then you don't know yourself very well. If the biggest sinner you know isn't you, then you don't know yourself very well. Now, there was a time I would have really pushed back against that. I would have said, oh, well, look, I'm a sinner, but I'm not the biggest sinner I know. And in saying that, I was demonstrating my sin. This makes a lot more sense to me than it used to. I remember in college writing a paper about to Paul's words to Timothy, where Paul says that he is the chief of sinners. He says, I am of whom I am the worst. I remember writing about that and talking about Paul referencing you know, his past before he became a Christian of persecuting Christians in the road to Damascus. And, and he has this humble view of himself because of all of that. And he says, of whom I am, am the worst. And I remember my professor took a pen and circled the verb am, wrote present tense. He's not talking about I was the worst, I am the worst. And the more you know yourself and the more you understand the holiness of God, the more you recognize that the equation makes, makes sense. So we've been forgiven this debt, and the Bible says in Colossians 3, 13 that we are forgive, to forgive as the Lord forgave us. So as we wrap up, I just wanna give you a few quick equations that will help us choose grace, I hope. Number one, grace is greater than repayment. Repayment is this idea, is that they have to make it right. It's repayment. They have to make it right. I grew up being taught as a child that if I hurt someone, if I was disrespectful, if I was disobedient, whatever it is, that my job was to make it right. So I needed to say something or I needed to do something to make it right with that person. It's a good lesson for a child to learn. But it developed this kind of uh, unbiblical approach to forgiveness and grace because here's what I figured in my head is that when it comes to forgiveness, you know, when someone hurts me, that forgiveness comes when that person who hurt me makes things right. Yeah, yeah. When you say something, when you do something to make things right, I will forgive you. Problem is, that's not forgiveness. That's not grace. It's justice. See, we want repayment, but what do you do? And some of you know this. Some of you know this. What do you do when you are hurt so badly that there's nothing that can be said and there's nothing that can be done to make it right. What are you gonna do then? It's gonna happen if it hasn't. Or someone does something to you that is so wrong and so hurtful that the moment you find out about it, you know there's nothing they can say. There is nothing you can do, they can do to make it right. See, that's when grace comes in. The Bible says in verse 27 of the master that, that he, he canceled the debt. The idea is that he erased it completely, right? They didn't, he didn't just extend the note or make it interest only. He canceled the debt. It's what God has done for us. It's not earned. Now trust may need to be earned, but grace is not earned. When you make grace dependent on the person who hurt you making things right, then you need to find a new word for it because it's not grace. Secondly, grace is greater than revenge. Revenge is this, that I'm gonna hurt the person the way that I've been hurt. And that's what a lot of us, um, a lot of us do. We spend our lives with that approach. And someone has referred to this as sitting in God's chair. Because look, you don't know their story. You don't know how they have been hurt. You don't know what God's gonna do in the future. You don't know how he's gonna redeem and work things for you. You don't know. There's so much you don't know. And so when you decide you're going to take it into your own hands, you're playing God. The Bible says in Romans 12, don't take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath. And so it means that you're gonna release the right to retaliate. And that's what it says, verse 27. It says he canceled the debt and let him go, let him go. Both hands, release him. Let him go, let her go. It's not fair, I know it's not fair. They don't deserve it, I know they don't deserve it, I know that, let them go. It doesn't mean you're not gonna hurt. Grace doesn't mean that you won't feel pain anymore. In some ways, grace means that you're choosing to live with pain or the consequences of another person's sin, but they can't make it right. I mean, they can try and it might make you feel better, but ultimately when you're really hurt, there's nothing they can say and there's nothing they can do. It just, it just hurts. 
And I'm wondering if you can think of another story where someone else perhaps took on your pain and your suffering, where someone else said, okay, I'll take the consequences of your sin upon myself. Lastly, grace is greater than resentment. Resentment is, I'm going to quietly become more and more angry, which is how a lot of us handle hurts from people we're close to, like we know life is gonna go on, or maybe it's a lot of little things that just build up and we just quietly become more and more angry and then we just nurse the offense and relive the pain and we have this like, uh, playback button in our head where we constantly push play and we just remember how, how we've been taken advantage of or how we've been disrespected or how we've been mistreated. We're just gonna quietly become more and more angry but when you choose resentment, do you know who pays for it? Yeah, you do. Someone defined resentment as drinking a bottle of poison and waiting for the other person to die. It's not real effective, right? It's interesting in this story is that... Uh, so this guy is forgiven 150 million bucks, refuses to forgive $20, and then he has the guy who owed him $20 thrown in prison. But you know who, pay, in the ancient world, you know who paid for that? He did. So he could take someone who owed him $20 and have that person thrown in prison, but he had to pay for that person to be punished. That's how it worked. That's how it works. You can do it. They might deserve it. And you can lock him up and put him in prison and you can make him pay for it. But guess who pays that bill? You do. You're the one who pays for it. And I, I love the words of Matthew West's song, Forgiveness, where he says, the prisoner that it really frees is you. And so here's, here's the perspective Jesus gives us, is that look, you're never gonna be asked to forgive more than you've been forgiven. Grace is greater than. It's greater than your sins, it's greater than your hurts. Because we owe this massive debt to God, but through Jesus, he wipes it clean. That our records and the records of Jesus are exchanged. He takes ours upon himself, we get his. We are now, the Bible says, without blemish or defect. We are made righteous and holy, that our sins are removed from us as far as the east is from the west, and they're buried in the deepest part of the ocean. That's us, that's what we've received. And so that is what we give. Let me wrap it up just with this idea, okay, the key to giving grace, I, I, I mean hard, messy grace, the key to giving grace is to stop thinking about what's been done to you and to start thinking about what Jesus has done for you, that's it. And it's, it's hard, I'm not saying that's easy, I'm just saying you have to stop. When the bitterness starts to grow, when the rage starts to set in, you have to stop and you have to think. You have to stop thinking about what's been done to you and you need to replace it with thoughts of what has been done for you because what has been done for you will give you the grace to forgive what has been done to you. Let's pray. God, I personally don't think you can do this without Jesus. I just don't, I just don't know how. I mean, I, you know, it's one thing to forgive some, some of the little offenses, some of the expected offenses. A lot of us are just a little too sensitive, frankly. A lot, of, a lot of our hurts don't need to be forgiven. They just need to be overlooked graciously. But God, there are just enough of us and there are certain times in life where it's, it's just really painful and it was really wrong and it hurts so God, we need your perspective on this. Would you help us understand what you've done for us through your son Jesus? Would you help us understand the, the pain and the suffering that our sin brought upon him? And then Lord, would you allow that grace as we receive it, as it sets us free, would you help that grace just overflow and set those around us free and that this would just be a community marked by grace? Jesus, we love you and... Um, I pray that, that we would demonstrate our understanding and our acceptance of your grace this week by giving it to others. It's in Jesus' name, amen.